Hello, it's Richard Pierce from Finextra TV. Um, today, we're going to talk about the role of the financial services industry in addressing the biodiversity crisis. Um, at the same time as the ESG greenwashing debate heats up, we're seeking to address the data needs of the industry in financing nature. Uh, it's not simple. So I'm delighted to talk today with David Craig. Hello, David. Hi, Richard. Nice to see you today. Well, let's introduce you. I'm sure you don't need any introduction, but let's not assume that. David is co-chair of the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD. It's the global task force that has now over 400 market members endorsed by the G7, G20, funded by 10 governments, uh, as well as WWF, UNDP and Global Canopy. Um, the TNFD's goal, and David will expand on this for us, is to create a risk management and disclosure framework for nature related risk, directing financial flows to nature positive outcomes. Now, David was the former CEO of Refinitiv, one of the largest data and technology providers to financial markets. So he knows about this industry uh, from every perspective, and particularly to Finextra readers where we care about the tech and the data. So welcome, really thrilled to have you on board. And I want to go straight in with the question for people. How do you actually measure nature and biodiversity risk and what is the TNFD framework proposing? Well Richard thank you uh, as you said it's complicated um, our job is to try and make it as simple as possible uh, to create to create something um, for the market by the market that we can adopt um, to do this because what we're learning is that we have inherent risk in the system from dependencies on nature and the natural services that we rely upon in the same way that we have risk from climate and physical risk there as well. So we have to try and get an understanding of, well, how do we measure this risk? Um, how do we manage the risk? And then how do we disclose to allow investors of companies to compare and contrast? What we think about with risk is looking at dependencies and, and impacts. Um, where are the ecosystem services, like the provision of fresh water or um, the availability of um, ground that can grow plants, those types of ecosystem services. Where do I have dependencies on ecosystem services? Um, and what would happen if those were to be removed or degraded? Uh, in, in many times, unfortunate they are. So we look at this from a dependencies lens, but also an impacts lens. Well, where am I actually creating damage to, say, fresh water, or I'm overusing fertilizer? Um, or putting pollutants in the ground. And those impacts may also cause risk. And what we do is we map that then towards risks and opportunities and into enterprise value. So trying to put a numeric number on all of this is really quite hard, almost impossible, but trying to think through where I have those risks and dependencies, uh, where am I creating impacts and where do those create issues to my enterprise value is how we think about the framework and how we're designing the framework to be adopted by the market. Excellent. And, you know, you talk about the market. Do you think you have the attention of the market leaders on this issue? And uh, what are you seeing, particularly as we come out of Davos? And that's often a good time to feel the temperature. Well, I think a couple of things are changing. Um, you, you say we feel the temperature. I think the natural world is feeling the temperature of climate change. And as temperatures increase and weather patterns change, uh, flooding, high winds, storms, uh, all the rest of it, what we're learning is that a lot of the physical risk isn't just in buildings and structures, but it's actually in natural production. It's it's the wheat harvests or the soy harvests or the grain harvests that are failing because of high heat in, say, India. Uh, and so what people are learning is that actually um, climate change is damaging the natural ecosystem and therefore nature risk is becoming clearer, more urgent um, than we had appreciated beforehand. I have a saying that says that nature risk versus climate risk is more direct and it is more immediate. If you emit carbon dioxide or greenhouse equivalents, yes, you're contributing to the global um, concentration of, of greenhouse gases, but the impact on you is shared by everyone or it might not happen immediately. But if you damage the ecosystem services that you rely upon in the environment that you're in, the impact is more direct and it is more immediate. And, and in a way, people are realizing that nature related risk has to be dealt with, if not as urgently, more urgently than climate risk. And we certainly need to start looking at them together. I, I don't think we've won that argument everywhere, but I'm certainly seeing in the market, people are realizing that looking at nature and climate together, these are two sides of the same coin, is becoming really important. Yeah, and, and it's certainly just in the last, it feels like the sort of last 12 months, you know, the. Uh, uh, the ratchet has become you know very clear that people are taking much more attention to this area now 
targets are always a question you, you mentioned measure and management um, and re regarding targets net zero is obviously you know with, with whatever failings it has but it has a you know it's a clear uh, target many markets and conservation leaders are talking about nature positive by 2030 and then there's the 20, you know 30 by 30 50 by 50 numbers that people bandy around what does it mean and how do you align to it at TNFD? Well, I think um, like net zero, nature positive is something that you can certainly get behind and, and everyone loves using the phrase. We, we want businesses to be nature positive. We want to move to a planet that is in a nature positive direction, as you say, um, stopping degradation and actually positive restoration of the natural system starts by 2030. And, and the good news is the natural system is actually very quick and good at restoring itself. Um, so if we give it a chance, um, there's a there's a chance it could actually do it. Um, the exact and specific measures of that are not quite there yet, um, but those are being developed. We have the, the CBD, the Convention for Biodiversity, which my co-chair chairs, Elizabeth Remner, um, trying to create the global biodiversity framework, trying to get 170 countries to agree to global, national and local targets. It takes some time to do that. So we're kind of where TCFD was when it first started. It, it it started and was running for a couple of years before the 1.5 degree science-based target arrived. So we're in that kind of space, but I think people see that the targets are coming. Um, nature positive is something that people are really using now as a, a, a direction of travel. I think when we have more specific measures that demonstrate how you contribute towards nature positive, uh, like the 30 by 30, I think that of course will be really helpful. Um, but I don't see people stopping now. I think people are generally accepting that this is coming. Um, and like lack of data, I think lack of targets might be a little bit of an excuse for an action, frankly. I think we have to start moving now. And we have to recognise we've got real risk from nature uh, and we have to manage it. And we have to start disclosing against it so financial investors can understand what we're doing. Thanks for that. I, th I like the fact that you're sort of saying, yeah, we just got to get on with it uh, in, in the absence of some things. And, you know, that takes me to my next question, which is yeah. know, at, uh, at Finextra and SustainableFinance.Live, we've been talking about these topics. Uh, we're heading into a hackathon around it. We're yeah. taking that more of a sort of tech industry lens, which is, you know, let's just try and iterate, find solutions, innovate, get into accelerators, you know, show the world what good looks like. You come from that sort of tech industry. You bring that understanding <laughs> and, and you've brought some of that into the way TNFD operates. Can you can you expand on that for us? Yeah, I mean, um, since we've started, we've taken a software type iterative approach to the development of the TNFD framework. Uh, we shocked everyone, first of all, by saying that we 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 launched the program with Elizabeth, myself in, in June as co-chairs. We got the members on board in September and we declared that um, in Q1 of uh, 2022, we would release the first framework version and everyone was quite shocked by that. But we explained this minimal viable product, this iterative approach. It's important to get people looking at it, to test it, to pilot it, to give feedback and then to iterate the next version. And, and that's exactly what we've done. Um, we released that first version uh, in March. We've had fantastic feedback. It's not just a document, which tends to be how people do this. It is a document, but it's also an online version. It's very interactive. You can actually put real-time feedback into that, and we've collected that feedback. Uh, I'm releasing an, a second version um, uh, at the end of June, so just in a few weeks' time now. Um, enhancing what we did in the first version, taking on that feedback and trying to move really quickly. We've got another version in October, another version in February, aiming to get a production version of a completed framework into the market by really Q3 2023. So quite short time frames, but um, you know, we did start way after TCFD. We've had a few years less than they have had to do this. And as I said earlier, the, the, the challenge is quite urgent that we need to address um, and therefore this approach so far seems to be working quite well. Yeah absolutely uh, and certainly uh, having waded through many a long report I sometimes wonder if we're adding to the greenhouse gas problem uh, with all these reports uh, and I like your approach. Um, moving to the data question specifically you know people say there's not enough data to measure you know climate carbon greenhouse gas uh, uh, targets let alone nature in fact in where do I even start? Um, do you agree that there are gaps to, again to your point do do we need to worry about that too much what's your what's your take on the on the data question which well, a uh, really interesting richard i mean ev every day another data company um, kind of contacts me and says we do want to we want to show you what we're doing um 
in this space. It's quite amazing to see the amount of innovation that's happening um, in this area. Call it spatial data, call it spatial finance. There's a number of terms uh, around it. <clears throat> now, in, in some ways, this is not new. Um, Refinitiv did um, mapping for many years of ships and crop production, as did Bloomberg and others in the market, so that traders and investors could look at weather patterns, crop and commodity production, um, oil and gas shipments. Um, and the NGOs and government-backed organizations, such as the UN um, and their tool Encore, um, Global Forest Watch, Global Ocean Watch, I mean, many companies have been looking at data around the environment <clears throat> for many years. So in, in some way, it's not new, but a couple of things are happening that's new. Firstly, um, the demand for this data and for finance to look at this data and corporates is now at an all time high. Suddenly, location is becoming important. Um, as we um, released in our first framework, it's really important to understand the location of where you're operating and the ecosystem that it's in. So therefore, the demand for spatial data about that environment, about the ecosystem services, about the dependencies that I have there and the sensitivities in that environment suddenly become very high. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is the amount of technology that's now available um, that is co collecting or producing this data um, is is exploding. I think in 2020, something like 1,200, um, they're called small satellites, um, were launched. It's growing about 30% every year. So satellites that are looking at ground earth, they're looking at cloud formations, they're looking at emissions of greenhouse gases, they're looking at the oceans. Uh, monitoring everything that's happening. So you've seen this explosion of, of data measurement. Um, you're also seeing a big growth, of course, in, in data processing. I met a firm the other day that's using sound monitoring to actually listen to the biodiversity in an area um, and use artificial intelligence and machine learning to record and learn what normal sounds like and how man's activities, human activities, um, could be affecting that. So you're seeing this huge growth in the data source and availability, huge growth in data processing. Um, what is not quite there yet is, I, I call it the gap between it. So finance looks at assets and they look top down. At, well, where are the assets and where are they located? What are the sensitivities, those dependencies and impacts that I talked about? The, the sort of NGO environmental watch, these data sources come bottom up. They look at areas and they look at the sensitivities or degradation. And what we've got to do is marry the two together. Uh, and we've got to do that in a, a consistent and scalable way. A, a lot of the data analysis and research is done sort of as a one off project. Um, and now for finance and investors and corporates to do this again and again and again and make it consistent and scalable and repeatable, we've got to automate that. We've got to make it easier. We can't have teams of PhDs doing this uh, at a project at a time. You've got to do it for a whole corporation. So I think the gap that we have to close is how do we marry the bottom up? Um, of the spatial data on the environment with a top down of the asset data of the organizations, including their upstream supplies and the downstream distribution. And then how do we make that scalable, consistent um, and repeatable? So year after year, you can look at the same data sets and compare and contrast and get something that is trustworthy and reliable for, for investment grade data. Yeah, I'm, and, and that's easily said. I know you don't say it easily, but um, to, to bring together the, the asset data and also the legal entity ownership of that uh, data, which is pretty tough, and roll it up to a sort of portfolio analysis level, which uh, can be, you know, put on a single screen, you know, giving your background, you know this very well. Um, you know, the, the sort of massive modeling cube to the spreadsheet, uh, you know, is, is the kind of challenge. How do you see that being approached? Is it a sort of a an open source model as we're seeing in some of the carbon areas. How, how do you see that being done? Is it one big firm uh, or a number of players? One of you know one big one arrives at the end of it. Hey, so a couple of things happening, and and uh, which direction this goes, we we could take some guesses at. Um, I mean, firstly, several of the members of of the TNFD. So we have four hundred members. Uh, in the group now, several of which are in the design team, have, have actually done their own asset location mapping themselves. Mm. Um, one large food company, a global food company, spent three years looking at every single asset and operation it had, um, plus looking up its supply chain and mapping them to specific, you know, literally down to the sort of 200 meter square location of where those activities were. Um, now, they did that themselves, and then they can bring that bottom up data of the ecosystems, the sensitivities, uh, biodiverse sensitive to the areas, um, uh, biodiversity, species counts, all of that sort of data can then be mapped into that so they can look at the environment that they're in. 
Um, there are other companies that are trying to do this commercially off data that's available out there. There are, there are commercial companies now taking disclosed data of legal entities um, and creating asset locator databases, various claims about how many thousands of companies they've been able to do that for. Um, and of course, it's it's not easy. It's not straightforward because if you go to a legal entity database and say, well, you know, where where is IBM? If I pick, pick on IBM located, well, you'll get maybe a country, you'll get a, um, a, a city, but you won't get a specific location of where they are versus where the ecosystems located and the sensitivities around that ecosystem. So it is not an easy job. Um, it takes some hard work to do that, but I think people are realizing that they've got to have some kind of acid information to get that done and map that against the ecosystem areas. We call them biomes in the TNFD framework. Um, and I'm really encouraged that commercial organizations are picking this up because it requires capital investment. Um, the NGO organizations that have been working have been working for 10, 20, 30 years on, on building environmental data, um, and they've done a fantastic job. We can't spend as long doing the asset map. We've got to get commercial investment and capital investment in there to get the asset map working as well. So my prediction is it's not going to be a, a big open source free database. I think it's a combination of companies doing it themselves, commercial companies creating asset location databases, and then NGO and free data being pulled into that that has the environmental information that's available today. And do you, I mean, you know, given it's a crisis and the lessons that you've learned through both, you know, working with Refinitiv as well as obviously observing what TCFD uh, and the carbon guys have been doing, if you take your last point, um, people like OS Climate have emerged, which try to bring together public and private, um, um, you know, commercial and non-commercial uh, models as a sort of super aggregator uh, of all those sources and then use secure <laughs> confidential computing to, you know, knit that together to protect everybody. Can you see us heading in that sort of direction with nature? Well, I think we've got to sort of go back to the problem before we sort of jump to a, well, there's a big open source database and it just pulls everything together and, you know, you sort of open it up and, and there's your answer. Um, there's, a, there's a few issues at the moment. Um, uh, there are gaps in data. Um, there are gaps in certain areas of, of data coverage. Um, there is a gap around um, time. So sometimes you get data that was, you know, four years old and then it's repeated again two years later, but not on a repeatable pine. So we've got to have data that scales, not just geographically, but actually scales um, over time. So there's some work to do there. But I think the biggest gap to me is that um, uh, the gap around standard measurements and metrics um, is important. So if we pull a lot of data together that's all in different forms, all you get is a big database, but the data still doesn't talk to each other. We've got to create, as your earlier question um, highlighted, better metrics, better standards and better processes. Now, T TNFD can solve some of that by standardizing the approach that we take for risk management, um, CBD and the global biodiversity, biodiversity framework will help standardize a lot of the metrics as well. So I, I think we've got to be careful to think that we can just pull lots of data together and it will work together. We've got to actually get better standards, definitions um, um, agreed as well, so that we can have more comparable data, more usable data um, to do that. And, and then of course, I think disclosures plays a really important role. Um, there is hardly any disclosed data on um, biodiversity in nature at the moment. There's some around water use, there's some around forest and land use. But part of the goal of the TNFD is that when companies have been through this comprehensive risk management framework, um, that they will also be disclosing data, you know, annual reports where they disclose the metrics against um, the dependencies they have and potential risks that they have, um, but also making available data on a more private basis for investors and others to use it. And I think that's where TCFD, TNFD, and then ultimately the standards bodies can play a really important role to make sure really investment grade data is also available. And you, you make the, the, the very strong point about risk and risk management frameworks. When you actually think about risk models, um, this data that we're talking about often ends up in some asset managers risk model uh, where they calculate you know, the viability of the capital allocation. Um, do you think that that industry, the risk management industry and the models are, if you like, moving from the historical looking view to this, uh, you know, dynamic and somewhat unpredictable data world that we're heading uh, into? Well, well, I think um, some of the linear models that have looked at sort of degradation over years of now finding that actually some of the degradation is non-linear and it's accelerating very quickly. 
um, you know, some of the some of the best modelers in the financial industry and in the insurance industry, they've been doing this for many years. And they're, of course, looking at climate and physical risk and insured assets and what are the issues happening there. So I, I do think the models will be stressed um, because I think some of the degradation we're seeing is nonlinear um, and some of the issues that we're seeing are nonlinear as well. So um, again, it comes having good data is great. Um, but if data is only sort of telling you what's happened over the last 20 years, not necessarily what could happen over the next five or 10 years, then you've got to be careful that your models aren't assuming um, a linear pattern to that. Indeed. Um, what are some of the barriers to adoption? How, how are you helping uh, to address those, uh, those, those barriers? <laughs> well, there's a couple of things that we're, we're doing. On the data side, we are actually launching a data catalyst. Um, you know, what will that do? Well, what we will bring together is um, data companies, both commercial, government-backed, free, and we'll invest time in educating them on the TNFD approach, um, the methodology that we're using, the approach and the language and the definition that we've designed using all the scientific partners that we have, um, and leverage our member network to say, look, we'd like to do pilots, we'd like to do test cases, um, we'd like to demonstrate how this works. One of the, one of the biggest pieces of feedback from the first release was please show us how to do this, show us illustrative case examples. How can we do this? Where's the data? So I think a lot of this is not about just designing the perfect framework, but also showing people a way of using it. The more case studies we have using data, um, the better. The, the more aligned we are to those standard metrics and terminology, the better. So we're trying to, if you like, accelerate the path using a data catalyst um, to do that. I think training and education is really important. It's, it's something that's often overlooked in, in many of the change projects that we have. This is an, an immense change project. We're changing how capital markets assess risk, um, assess nature-related risk and opportunities. We're using data and technology to do that. But that's a change process, and we need to not underestimate the importance of training people and educating people in well, what are ecosystem services, um, what, are, what is a biome? How do I think about my location against a biome, which is a, a set of specific attributes to an ecosystem or an area? How do I think about nature risk? So I think training, as well as creating a data environment and producing a lot of case studies and examples is really important. Uh, and that's something that we are investing quite a lot of time in. Yeah, it's so important. I think on my screensaver, I have sort of, you know, flocks of birds, herd of wildebeest, you know, all these sort of things. And humans, we're sort of flocking animals as well, aren't we? We need to see a good example of what to do and be taught, you know, by the matriarch, if you want to call TNFD that, how we actually exploit um, those resources. So, um, yeah, very much into the case study uh, approach that you've described. Yeah. Now, I, I really feel as though we could talk for hours. Uh, as we know, people have a sh you know short attention span. So hopefully we can come back with some more uh, content as the TNFD framework uh, uh, unfolds uh, and gives us more information over time. But uh, for now, David, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And if people want to sign up to the TNFD, uh, tnfd.global, uh, if you're a data or technology firm and want to join the Catalyst, it's an open environment. Um, so again, come to tnfd.global. Uh, we're launching imminently, so you'll be able to join that um, uh, and participate in, in the Catalyst development. Thank you very much, Richard. My pleasure. Thanks for that. Thank you.